Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from Lexington, Kentucky, word recording artist, Mike and Rose Morky. People, when they get saved, they don't want to get saved. See, lots of people, you talk to them about getting saved, and they say, I don't want to get saved. If I get saved, I won't get to do none of the stuff I want to do. Well, I've been saved for 17 years, and I still get to do all the stuff I want to do. I smoke all the dope I want to smoke. I drink all the booze I want to drink. And I run around with all the women I want to run around with. It's just that since I've been saved, I find that I don't need booze to make me feel like a man. I don't need marijuana to face tomorrow. And when you're married to a fillet, you don't run around with green baloney. <laughs> And I would like it if nobody goes to the bathroom while we're preaching, because we got to go too. <laughs> and if we got to suffer, we want you all to suffer with us. We call it a sacrifice unto the Lord. <laughs> uh, don't, don't pray for his healing, because the Lord's proven he can use brain damage for his glory. Okay? Uh, do people ever ask you if I suffer from mental illness? Yeah. What do you tell them? No, he enjoys it. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yes, we are the Christian Sonny and Cher. <laughs> you may be here waiting for us to get spiritual. This is it. If you ain't blessed now, you ain't going to be blessed, but you may as well... <laughs> You may as well get used to us tonight because if you don't, your first thousand years in heaven's gonna be miserable because we're gonna be there, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and by the time the evening is over, we're gonna know which ones of you like us and which ones of, us, uh, which ones of you don't. And when we get to heaven, we're gonna move in next door to y'all. <laughs> And you know what happens when hippies move in the neighborhood? The property value, whew, you know. I mean, I mean I tell you, I'm going crazy again, huh? I, I, you know, I used to do drugs before I got saved, and I had these, I, these real black, bad flashbacks, <laughs> like that one. Whew. People should never come up to an ex-doper and flash things in their face. Now, where you were is okay, and you can take pictures if you like. But please, after this, if we're, you know, like out in by the records and stuff, don't come up and go, <laughs> you know, because I'll go, <laughs> you know, and, I, I, and she has to take me home in a little sack. You we, know, listen, <laughs> we, we, drive, we used to drive home in the way hours of the night from the airport, about two hours, and we had this van, and one night, you don't let him drive anywhere, see? Because he can't see real good. And he has these flashbacks. So? And so, so this night he was driving home, and it was real late. It was about 2 in the morning. And I'm kind of dozing off over there. And all of a sudden... Kind of dozing off. Uh, you know. Well, That's like saying I eat like a bird, a buzzard. <laughs> I, we're driving along, and the, and, and the van kind of goes like this. And, and it wakes me, and I, and I looked over, and I said... Michael, I said, what's the matter? He said, there's deer on the road, Rose. And I, I looked, you know, I didn't see anything. I thought, God, I'd like to see the deer, you know. And, and we were fine and all that. So we, it's he, Bambi. <laughs> so so he, he continues to drive on, and I kind of doze off again. And all of a sudden, I hear this, you know, like this again. And I said, Michael, what is it? He said, they're on the hood, Rose. <laughs> I said, Michael, the, no, the deer are not on the hood, okay? They're not on the hood. And they're not, probably not even on the road, okay? So just, you know, let's just get on home. So he starts driving on, and, and I'm dozing off again. All of a sudden, this big swerve, I really about came out of my seat on him this time. I said, what is going on? He said, they're trying to get in the window, Rose. <laughs> 
I said, get out, get they out. Are, they're hanging on the side of the thing, going, through the window. <laughs> you know, but I, I used to have guys that lived behind my ears on my glasses, you know? When my hair was real long, they'd hide back there, and every once in a while, they'd run out and go, ha, and they'd run back, you know? <laughs> and, uh, That's true. You can handle uh, that as long as you're not trying to convince a cop you didn't do whatever it is he thinks you did, you know? You're standing there going, honest to God, officer, I'm straight. <laughs> you know, and he... <laughs> cop cars are a lot of fun to ride in because there's lots of things to hang on to. <laughs> and you can't fall out. <laughs> you know, anyway, anyway, the little guys that live behind my ears when I got my hair cut and got this uh, puff ball, they got embarrassed about their housing. So they moved out of behind my ears and they moved into my armpits. <laughs> yeah. And now every once in a while they reach up and go, gotcha. And I go, whoa, you know. <laughs> now, if I'm around charismatics, they don't mind. But if I'm around Baptists, they start going, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, the Pentecost and the Pentecostals say, he healed me. <laughs> yeah, I remember one of people get really, uh, they get, they see, they get confused about what's happening sometimes because they like look at things only from their perspective. Like one night, I was using a microphone, didn't have a windscreen on it, and I said something with a P in it, and there was a short in the thing, and I went, you know, and spit on the thing, and this big blue light went, z -z -z bang, you know, and I went, oh! Lady in the front row said, bless him, Jesus, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I wasn't getting blessed, I was getting tattooed, you know, I mean, I was standing up here getting my lip welded to my teeth, you know, I didn't need blessed, I need hands laid it on me, you know, matter of fact, I needed a glass of water laid it on me because my mustache caught on fire, you know, so, I, I had to do the rest of the sermon with smoke signals. <laughs> the most favorite question asked me is what it's like to live with Mike Warnke. <laughs> it's just like this. <laughs> <laughs> like living with a hippopotamus with a rash, you know. I never sit still. <laughs> <laughs> Think I'm bad now? I've already been helped. <laughs> What's really interesting is to try to explain this behavior over to bank when you're trying to borrow money. Yeah. <laughs> I just sit there and go, go ahead. <laughs> We're good risk, no problem. <laughs> what do you want to do with it? We're going to invade Afghanistan and kick them Russians out. That's what we're going to do. Well, how are you going to do that? We're building a plane in the backyard. <laughs> what are you using? A tub? <laughs> they don't, they're very uh, conservative at the bank. <laughs> it's also very interesting to watch him go over and talk to our children's teachers at school. When they have grade time, you know, he goes over and the teacher sits there and starts to explain to us about the fact that our daughters who's 17, going to be 17's grades are not what they should be. And Michael sits there and says, we don't really care. <laughs> we, we think it's more important for her to be spiritually sound. <laughs> it's very interesting to watch their faces as they expel her. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, grades, you know, I, I don't care. I want her to get the knowledge, you know, and it's A, B, and C stuff. I know that that's, you know, the way things are. And, of course, you know, when I got her home, I said, hey, you know, give it a shot. The guy's going crazy here pulling his hair out for these letters. So, you know, make his life a little easier. Okay. So she goes back and starts acing all of the exams, getting A's and stuff like that. She can do it. Not the thing, you know. This teacher's kind of uptight. You know, he's got one of these guys wears his collar real tight and so his neck looks like it's a pumpkin emerging from a marble bag, you know. <laughs> real serious about everything, you know. Bless. Well. <laughs> this is U.S. history and if you don't learn this, you'll die. <laughs> you know? 
Well, people make everything that they do real serious, you know, to justify their existence. You know, that's the neat thing about being a Christian. If you know the Lord, you don't need to be real serious about everything you do to justify your existence because if Jesus loves you, you're justified enough. You know what I mean? And uh, it's a lot of freedom. We're going to ask Aaron out right now and do a song for you that um, is really appropriate for what's been happening to uh, the ministry in the last two or three years particularly. It's called When I Grow Up. And uh, <laughs> it has a funny title because Aaron's uh, small, but he's a great and mighty person. And all my life I tried to grow up. Somebody was saying to me, what are you going to do when you grow up? Um, won't you be glad when you grow up? Um, aren't you, don't you want to be just like me when you grow up? And we spend a lot of our lives trying to be like somebody we look up to so that when we grow up we can be like them. And this song tells about who we really need to be like when we grow up. I suppose we all have someone we look up to, someone special we adore. When I take a look at me in the light of what I'd like to be, I find myself Looking up to you, Lord And when I grow up I, I wanna, wanna be just like you I wanna learn to love the way you do I like for people to say with a smile He's surely his father's child And when I grow up I want to be just like you Father, I know you say Blessed are the children Surely there's a lot of child in me What I'd love to learn to do Is walk in spirit and grow in truth Everything I see in you I'd like to be When I grow up I want to be just like you I want to learn to love the way you do I'd like for people to say with a smile She's surely her father's child And when I grow up I want to be just like you When I grow up I want to be just like you I want to learn to love the way you do I'd like for people to say with a smile She's surely her father's child And when I grow up I want to be just like you, Lord. And when I grow up, I want to be just like you.
You know me and Rose are from the mountains. You knew that. <laughs> Up the mountains, when they do things, they take them to the ultimate extreme that you can take them to. <laughs> you ever heard of a church split? That's a game Christians play. It's called this bunch gets mad at this bunch over here and instead of keeping the congregation together, they all flounce off in different directions and start their own gig and let the thing that the Lord has brought forth in that congregation there suffer and die because they're too proud to sit there and take something or understand somebody that they don't agree with or just swallow their pride and forget to be so snooty. Well, I don't see what's so wrong with church splits. If you get a church of a thousand people and it splits, then you got two churches of 500. No, you don't. You get a church that splits. You don't get two churches of 500 from a thousand thousand member congregation it splits you get two churches of a hundred each and you get 800 people that won't go to church anymore because they're sick and tired of seeing the infighting in the garbage <laughs> up in the mountains we had a case of a split church these people got mad and they split the church and one group went off that way and one group went off that way and the dead of night, this group over here came back, took a chainsaw and cut the church house in half with the chainsaw and carried their half away. <laughs> now that was a church split. <laughs> and that really happened. And this church over here, this bunch, they had their half and this bunch had their half and the wind blew in both half and the rain blew in both and neither one could use their half for anything. And the only person that was the victor was the devil because all the sinners up in that area saw these people acting like a bunch of jerks and they all laughed and snickered and said, if that's what Christian is, I don't want to have anything to do with it because I can drink booze and be an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Never ever notice how lots of people think we're crazy because we're Christians? Do you ever wonder why? You ever wonder why it's just a natural assumption that people make if you get saved, you're nuts? You go out and join the uh, special class for cosmic consciousness down in the street. You sit around and eat yogurt and chant boogie-woogie till the sky falls in, and you're considered enlightened. But you come home and tell your folks you got saved, and they take you to a shrink. Oh my God, a Christian, we got to get that out of them. Let's deprogram them, you know. <laughs> the reason people in the world feel that way about Christianity is because they've been watching how we act. What would you think if you were standing beside the road and you saw the local Baptist church go by in pieces? <laughs> would you think that they had all their marbles, huh? Would you think they had both oars in the water, huh, huh? Wouldn't you think that their porch light was out, maybe? <laughs> that just happens up there in them mountains where everybody's hicky and stupid. Bunch of ignorant folks do that. Yeah, well, in New York City, there was an Italian church. Italian Pentecostal. They split right down the middle, too. You know what over? The hymn books. <laughs> See, one group thought that you should never eat any kind of meat with blood in it. When they slaughtered a chicken, they'd cut its head off, hang it up by the feet, and let all the blood drain out before they ate it. The other group didn't think it made any difference, so they cut the chicken's head off, take it in, cook it, and eat it. Big doctrinal difference, right? came time to buy new hymn books. The people who thought you shouldn't eat any blood, they wanted blue hymn books because that showed no blood. And the people that thought you was okay to eat blood, they wanted red hymn books because that showed it was okay to eat blood. Did they resolve their difference? No. This great big church fell all to pieces because the people in it who were supposed to be ambassadors of the Most High God the God who put the universe into position, who can count every atom in all his creation and not miss one, the God who is more intelligent 
and more superior and more wonderful than anything we can imagine. These were supposed to be children of His, and they couldn't agree over the color of a book. <laughs> Another church in the Midwest, they split too. You know what they split over? The deep and meaningful question, did Adam have a belly button or not? <laughs> Did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> Brand new beautiful church. They get this great artist to come in and paint these fantastic murals. And he paints a scene of the Garden of Eden. And there's Adam and Eve with tastefully appointed fig leaves so as not to freak anybody out. <laughs> However, in one, some of the fig leaves were a little low, and you could see Adam's belly button. And the controversy arose. Did he have a belly button or not? I mean, he didn't have a mother, so he didn't have an umbilical cord, so he probably didn't have a belly button. However, he was the prototype of all men, and if we had belly buttons, then he must have had a belly button. Big deal, right? I think God made Adam, and he saw that big expanse there with nothing in it, and he just went, you know, and there it was. The point I'm trying to make is, who cares? <laughs> While these people in here are fiddling around with belly buttons, <laughs> people in our town are going to hell. Not because they don't know about belly buttons, but because they don't know about Jesus, you know? I know what belly buttons are for anyway. They're to keep you salt in when you eat celery in bed. Brother Warnke, you're so funny, you're so ridiculous. <laughs> Just think, that's what half the world thinks when they look at you. Not because you're up in front of people telling jokes because it's the talent you got, because you pursue some of the things you do in the name of Jesus, and you make everything more important than just being Christ. Jesus wants you to be Him. Jesus wants you to live Him. Jesus wants people to look at you and recognize Him before they recognize you. And sweetheart, you can have perfect attendance pens cleared down to your knees, but when you burn, they will too. <laughs> and you can wear your American flag pen and your Southern Baptist Convention pen and your yellow and white Pope pen or your Presbyterian pen or your Methodist pen or your Church of Christ pen. Are you second St. Luke overcoming Pentecostal Church of God in Christ with fire and signs following him? <laughs> and all you've really done is stick a hole in your suit. <laughs> People keep telling me, hey, man. People see them pens, it gives me a chance to witness. Don't you think you'd have a better chance if they looked in your eyes and saw Jesus? Amen. I stand for Jesus Christ. I live for Jesus Christ. I work for Jesus Christ, and I'm not a bit ashamed. Yes, I go to church. Yes, I belong to a church. Yes, I'm part of a congregational body. Yes, and I believe in it too. But I'm telling you this. 
It takes a back seat to Christ. The church is not my God. My denomination is not my God. And when I go out to talk about salvation, I don't do it with a membership card trying to get my quota so I'll win the bicycle when we have Sunday school drive. I take this with me when I talk about the Lord. It's called the Word of God. And if I can get people to see Jesus in me and hear about Him from His words, and they come to a place where they're willing to accept Him, then I say amen for that. If they want to know where to go to church, I'll be glad to suggest some place. As a matter of fact, some of the people that I've witnessed to have asked me, and I haven't sent them to my church. Because some of the people that I've witnessed to wouldn't be comfortable in our church. Because our church does certain things. And they'd be more comfortable in this church over here. And it doesn't bother me to send them to this church over here because I know that church over there is full of Christians too. <laughs> you know what? We're the only advertising that the Lord has. A lot of people, yeah, yeah, brother, he does need advertising. Yeah, a lot of people don't think he needs advertising, so they sit around with their fingers in their ear, not doing what they're supposed to do and not showing Jesus to a dying world. But the world does need to know that the Lord's around and we're the best advertising that he's got. A lot of people think that uh, the job of evangelism, the job of evangelizing the world, is going to be done by the TV preachers. Some people think that it's going to be done by the people who make the records. Other people think that it's going to be done by the people who do these kind of concerts. But I got news for you. The best evidence that Jesus is alive in your neighborhood is you. I want to do a little experiment here tonight. How many of you tonight that are here are Christians? Just say amen. It was a shock to me some years ago to be confronted with the fact that all of a sudden I'm talking to the church, me, Mike Warnke. I, I, you know, I never thought I was called to talk to the church. I thought God just called me because he had a lot of weird people he wanted to get to, you know. <laughs> when we first started in the ministry, I was working in a coffee house, you know. I, I uh, got called by the Lord to go into this coffee house ministry, and we were reaching a lot of street people for the Lord. And I can remember how I got called. The Lord really didn't put the call on me first. He, he called somebody else. But because of some of, this, the, some of the problems that this man had with this calling, he got me and some other people like me to help him, you know. We were in this church, and this was in the days before it was cool to have a big testimony. I mean, there for a while, you know. It got to be there for a while. If you didn't have a testimony, nobody let you talk about Jesus, you know. I mean, you know, if you got up in church and you said, Hey, my testimony is... I got saved when I was five years old, and I'm 37 now, and I've been serving the Lord for 32 years, and it's really wonderful. Everybody go, blah, 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 you know. You get some guy come in here and say, yesterday I killed my mother, but last night I got saved. And they say, oh, tell us about Jesus, brother, you know. And, you know. and it's like, like the gruesomer the testimony, the more action you got. That's how I got into comedy in the first place. I have a pretty gruesome testimony. And when I first got saved, everybody wanted to hear my testimony. Well, not when I first got saved, but when I first got into the ministry, everybody wanted to hear my testimony. I got so tired of talking about the devil, and I saw people getting so tired of me talking about the devil, I started throwing a few jokes in just to lighten my testimony up, and lo and behold, everybody, everybody got more blessed by the jokes than they did by the testimony, and all of a sudden, I'm a Christian comedian. <laughs> in the beginning, though, I was in this church, and I was laying low because this was in the days before having a gruesome testimony was an in thing to do. And I was kind of laying low, and I used to go to church every Sunday and sit next to this lady. She's about 78 years old, and she had her hair, you know, in one of them buns, you know, big gray hair deal. And she did, did it so tight that her face was, you know, like that, you know. And, 
And she used to sit next to me, and she had no idea what my testimony was. I, I often kind of fantasized about looking at her and saying, you know, I used to be a Satanist and eat flesh and drink blood. Watch her go, ah, you know, just <laughs> pass out right there, you know. So, because, like, she's one of those ladies whose big sin was, like, she ate too many cookies. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, of course, people got a concept that there are good sins and bad sins and that people come up to me all the time and say, you know, brother, I was bad, but I wasn't as cruddy as you. <laughs> and I say, yes, I was pretty bad and I was going to the same hell as you, you know. Um, you know? The thing about it is, at least I knew I was going to hell. There's a whole lot of people out here think they're cool and they ain't going to go to hell and just think how much more horrible it is when they get down there and they're surprised, you know. <laughs> oh, I didn't even believe in this place, you know. And the uh, devil said, right, get in that line over there, you know. Anyway. <laughs> you know. So anyway, the preacher in our church, he knew about our testimonies, but most of the people in the church didn't. We're just keeping it kind of low, just kind of, you know, learning the word and growing and everything like that, and just kind of keeping a low profile. There's about six of us in the church been ex-heroin addicts and, you know, street people and stuff, but we were just, you know, we dressed and had our little haircuts and, you know, just kind of blended in with everybody else. <laughs> and uh, one day, the Holy Spirit descends on the preacher and gives him a burden to reach hippies. Now, this is really weird, see, because he didn't come out and get us to come to his church. We just kind of wandered in there from separate directions. We thought we just did it, you know, we'll oh, see, where shall we go to church, flip a coin, playing, you know, and we went. But actually, the Holy Spirit was leading us the whole time because he had this whole thing all rigged before we got into it, but we didn't know that, see. <laughs> Holy Spirit's good about that. He's got this whole plan. He's got it all mapped out, and you think you're going along on your own, he's going... <laughs> So anyway, the Holy Spirit descends on the preacher. Now, if I was God, I would have never chosen our preacher to descend on. <laughs> Not to reach hippies, because this guy was a square. You know what I mean? <laughs> now understand, there ain't nothing wrong with being square. If God has called you to be square, be square. It's all right. <laughs> There's room in the kingdom for everybody, you know? And if God's called you to be square, be square. But this guy was ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this guy was so square, he had polyester children. You know? This guy had a double-knit wife, you know what I'm saying? Living in a split level, two cars, the whole nine yards, you know? Wore those suits with checkers and different colored pockets. I mean, the whole deal, you know? And, and had hair so short that he had one of them white rims around his head, you know, and kind of, you know. And he always talked like a preacher, always talked like a preacher, always, 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 always. I mean, the guy never shifted out of reverend, you know what I mean? I mean, see, you go to church on Sunday morning, right? You go to church on Sunday morning, and the preacher's up there, and he's preaching a sermon, and he's got up there, and he's talking like this, and he's talking about the Lord, and he's bringing forth the Scripture. Yes, and he's telling you about how God wants you to act, and that's the way it's supposed to be done, because when you go to seminary, you learn how to talk this way. You learn this in homiletics class. You learn how to preach. You learn how to do public speaking. You see, this is called oratory, and there's nothing wrong with it, because this is the way that you get your point across. And this is something that you can do with feeling and vigor, and nobody it really minds. However, when everything is done, see, when everything is done and you're walking out of the church, the preacher's standing at the door. He's back down to normal, you know. Hey, good to see you this morning. Hi, little Charlie. How are you? Hey, isn't it wonderful? We're going to have a potluck Wednesday. Don't forget it, you know. And that's the way some people do, but not our preacher. Our preacher was in REV all the time. It had nothing to do with reverse either. I mean, he'd wake up in the morning and see his wife laying next to him in bed and say, Hallelujah, honey, I'm so glad to see you laying there. Why don't you hop up out of bed and run into the kitchen, fry me up a couple of eggs, fix me a couple of pieces of toast. Yeah. I mean, uh,
And God's got a sense of humor. God has got to have a sense of humor because God would not do the stuff that he does unless he had a sense of humor. God would have not created some of the animals that he has created unless he had a sense of humor. Look at the duck-billed platypus, man. That's either a joke or a mistake, and God don't goof, you know? So God, he's up there saying, hey, I got this burden. I think I ought to lay it on somebody. There looks like somebody that would really be weird to watch this work out with. Boom, you know? And he puts it on the preacher, you know? So the preacher, you know, all of a sudden, and he's got this burning desire to reach hippies. The only problem is he wouldn't know a hippie if one kissed him in the face, you know? So he at least has enough brains to come to some of the people like us that he knows is in his church to get some help comes over, I'll never forget it as long as I live, he comes over and sits on my couch, you know, and looks at me sitting there in a the chair and he tells me this burden is on his heart. He says, hallelujah, brother, one kid, those of us that have been entrusted with the welfare of our congregation in these last days before the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ have been laid upon by a mighty burden of the Holy Spirit to reach out into the highways and byways of this great metropolitan area and reach these no good low down pinko faggots for Jesus. <laughs> we know we have one difficulty yea we have one hurdle yes there is one thing that we cannot overcome and that is we wouldn't know a hippie if one tap danced across our nose so we decided to come to some of you freaks in the church and see if you can handle it and as you are the chief freak we decided to come to you first <laughs> And I didn't care why it gave me the opportunity. I was just glad to have it, you know. Because I really wanted to reach out into the streets and reach some of our people. And because, uh, you know, there was some really strange goings on in those days. The way we reached them is, is we, um, we opened this coffee house. And we played music and we gave away food. We opened this coffee house and we started having a lot of people come. We noticed right away that they were different than most people. And I had some problems uh, with relating to some of the music that we had, for example, like, you know, you can't go up to a guy on LSD and sing, I'll Fly Away. Because he, he'll fly away, you know. So we went to L.A. and we hired a Jesus rock and roll band for our first concert. We had a bunch of kids come. We had about 3,000 kids come and we had to close off our street and they were all sitting in the street, kind of made a big block party out of it and had the band out front. And after the concert was over and everybody had gone home, that day about three or 400 kids given their life to the Lord. And after it was all over, <clears throat> After it was all over, I was called in to make an accounting of myself. And I remember one of the deacons looking at me and saying, Brother, <laughs> I've been going to this church for 67 years. And we never did nothing like that before. <laughs> I said, you ever have 400 kids saved in one day before? He said, no. <laughs> I said, well, then what's the rub, bub? I said, when the Lord laid this burden on the pastor, he didn't lay this burden on the pastor so the pastor could win friends and influence people. And when the pastor came to me and asked my help because he needed somebody to show him what a hippie was, I didn't sit around and wonder who I was going to offend and who I wasn't going to offend because, you see, I didn't do any of this stuff for you. I did it for those 400 kids that got saved. Now. If you don't want it done this way, that's fine. But don't expect God to continue to bless 
the burden that he's put on your heart unless you're willing to do everything that you can do in your power, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you agree with it or not, to get the job done. You see, the thing about it is, folks, God has not called us to be correct. He's called us to be committed. He's called us to fulfill the Great Commission and that is to reach the world with a message of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if we've never done it before. It doesn't matter if that's new. It doesn't matter if it's something strange. If it's bringing forth results, if it's producing fruits, then we need to let it do whatever job that it's supposed to do. Now understand me, I'm not saying that rock and roll music should be played in every Sunday morning church service in the world, but I'm saying that there is a place for everything that God brings forth in the kingdom of God, and we better make a place for it if we're really going to do the job that we've been called to do, you know? I'm starting to get real fed up with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm starting to get real tired of Christians who have nothing for the Lord but excuses. I'm starting to get real tired of people who are more traditional than they are committed. And I'm getting real sick and tired of people who take and put their faith in the sign in front of the building that they go to on Sunday morning instead of the Jesus that's supposed to be in their heart. And I'm getting real sick and tired of people who are more interested in handing out their denominational state than they are in making a statement about Jesus with their lives and with their witness. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against the church. And if I was against the church, I wouldn't take my time to try and say some things to the church that I think that, that are needed to be said. If I wasn't a churchman myself, if I didn't believe in the local church, if I didn't believe that the church is the vehicle that God has chosen today to organize His people into an effective arm to reach the world for, for, for Himself, I would not say anything to the church. I would just let the church go down the tubes if that's what it wants to do. But I know that there are a lot of people out there in the world who need our witness, and they need it really bad. And so we haven't got time to play any of the games that we've been playing before, you see, because the Lord is coming back real soon, and He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. But that isn't the Baptist or the Methodist or the Presbyterian or the Catholics or the whatever. That's for all of us who have accepted Him and who are looking forward to His coming. And I don't know about you, but I figure that there's a room in that category for anybody who wants to come. When I go to heaven, I want to train to be full. I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I hope heaven's crowded. I know it won't be because there's enough of heaven to go around for everybody. But you see, I wouldn't care if I was up to my armpits and brothers and sisters because I know that that would make my father happy. And whatever makes my father happy makes me happy. You know what I mean? There are four things that people need to live a successful Christian life. One is prayer. The next one is food. Anything that doesn't eat is going to die. It's true in the flesh, it's true in the mind, and it's true in the spirit. But before you start to eat, you better remember there's only two kinds of spiritual food, angel's food or devil's food. You're going to be what you eat. The only way you can ever tell the difference between angel's food and devil's food is if you get familiar with the recipe for angel's food and it's right here in the cookbook. In other words, there's no substitute for Bible study in the life of a healthy Christian. All right? The next thing after food is faith. And faith's like a muscle. If you don't use it, it'll wither away. The, the best way to use your faith is to witness to other people what Jesus has done in your life because the more you talk about it and the more you live it, the stronger your faith will be. And the last thing you need is you need fellowship, and fellowship is spelled C-H-U-R-C-H. -H. What kind of church should I go to, Brother Warnke? What denomination should I belong to? I don't care. Go someplace where they teach you to do the first three things. Go someplace where you're allowed to pray. Go someplace where they believe in the Word. Go someplace where they believe in exercising their faith instead of sitting around on it, and you'll be going to the right kind of church, and it doesn't matter what the words are on the sign out in front.
Rosen Aaron sang a song. A song called, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be Just Like You. Well, brothers and sisters, it's about time we started growing up. It's about time we started showing some maturity. When I say maturity, I don't mean as mature Baptists or mature Methodists or mature Pentecostals. I'm not interested in how many gifts of the Holy Spirit you got. I'm not interested in whether you know all of the books backwards and forwards about prophecy that are on the markets today. I don't care how many tapes you bought last week. I'm talking about the maturity that produces the fruits. I'm talking about people who are peaceful and kind and loving and gentle because they've come to a place in their life when they're living for Jesus instead of some idea of their own religious roles. I'm talking about people who are producing a fruit that can be eaten by a starving world instead of a set of rules that nobody can live up to. I think it's time for us to mature. I think it's time for us to grow up. And I think it's time for people to look at us the way they look at my little girl. People look at my little girl and they say, Huh, I can look at you and I can tell whose little girl you are. You're Mike Warnke's little girl. And my son, they say, Huh, you'll never be able to deny him. He's a spitting image of you. Brother Warnke, he looks just like you. And Brother Warnke, she looks just like you. They're your children, all right. Well, whose child are you tonight, huh? Your society's child, your preacher's child, your denomination's child. You're a child of Fort Worth, you're a child of Texas, you're a child of the USA. Hmm? You're a Baptist child, a Methodist child, a Presbyterian child. You a Church of Christ child? You a Pentecostal child? A charismatic child? You you a son and daughter of Kenneth Copeland? <laughs> Kenneth Hagin? Derek Prince? Bob Mumford? Charles Simpson? Billy Graham? Whose child are you anyway? When people look at you, who do they see? Whose resemblance do you bear? The world is looking for God. The world is looking for Jesus. And just like they can look at Him and see us and know that we are His children, they can look at us and know that our Father is real. And it's time for us to bear resemblance to Him that has given us life. It's time for us to be the children of the Most High God. <laughs> Jesus has done a lot for us. He's taken us from death to life. He's given us our eternity secure. Some people don't believe in eternity. They think that there is such a thing as death. But let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as death. Human beings don't die. We have those old songs in the church, you know. If I know Jesus, I'll live forever. If I know Jesus, I'll never die. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you know Jesus or not, you're never going to die. <laughs> Human beings are immortal. Well, I don't see how you could say that. Why? 
My cousin died just last week. <laughs> Tell me something. If you're driving down the road in your Ford and the sucker conks out, and you open the door and step out into the street and start walking, do you cease to exist? No. You just start living in a different reality. You're walking instead of riding. <laughs> you know what this flesh is? Ladies and gentlemen, all this flesh is is a vehicle like a Ford. One of these days it's going to wear out and conk out. But you're not going to die. You're just going to pop into another reality. And the question you have to ask yourself is this. Not whether I live or die. Not whether I'm eternal or not. Not whether I live forever or not. Because, honey, you're going to live forever whether you want to or you don't. The question is, whose neighborhood are you going to be hanging out in? And for the majority of the people in this room, the answer is my eternity will be spent with God. But it's not because of anything you belong to. It's not because of anything that you've done. It's not because of any merit on your own. It's because Jesus Christ died on a cross and he gave his life and shed his blood so you would have an opportunity to know how you would spend your forevers. God has put the seal on forever for everyone who will accept him as Savior and Lord. That's a wonderful thing. How can you be so selfish? How can you be so blind? How can you be so unchristian as to take the joy and wonder and beauty of that and encase it in all your religious rigmarole and hide it from the world that's dying just to know what you know. How can you do that and call yourself a Christian? How can you do that? When the Lord weeps tears, when the Lord sighs a sigh, when the Lord's heart is broken every day, because people die, because people step out of one existence into another without a saving knowledge of him. And brothers and sisters, there are enough human beings on the face of this earth right now who know Jesus that if they would only become committed to the purpose of showing Christ before everything else, there'd be no problem winning this whole world for Jesus. Well, I really love you. Tonight I was talking to the church. I want you to decide whether God has called you to be comfortable or he's called you to be committed. And if you need to get something right with Jesus, spend a little time and just say yes because God's got it all planned. You don't even have to work it out. All you've got to do is accept what God's already done. God bless you all. Good night. Mm -hmm.